Okay, so thank you everybody for joining us today. It's such an honor to present um, and share with you um, some information about a remote sensing career um, at, and at Esri, what we're doing in that field. So we've had the intros. I'm gonna go over a little bit about um, some, you know, my career, starting with my career um, in remote sensing and geospatial. Um, and most folks in remote sensing, we've always been geospatial because our imagery, we've always tried to tie it to the ground to make sense of it. And then, you know, typically back in the day, remote sensing and GIS were a bit separated, but today's world, they're coming together. And I'm very excited about the ArcGIS platform because the increased um, capabilities on the remote sensing side within this software is just incredible. And I'll show you some of that. Um, and that. And then of course, ISPRS, I've been going to ISPRS for a long time. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but it's such a worthwhile um, organization, society, and the conferences every year. I'm sad that we wouldn't be at Nice this year, but I look forward to it next year. And I'll talk a bit about passion, because we think about career. Um, I think once you have passion in the belly, you'll never spend a day of working. You'll always be doing something you love. And I think you'll see that from Joseph, because Joseph, because he's very exciting and um, charismatic and you're going to get a, a taste of that um, after me um, so that that's wonderful um, then get a little bit about some of my other passions um, traditional survey and mapping and how it's evolving a bit and how ArcGIS is making it easier to be able to um, work in that field without having to be knee-deep in say photogrammetry and then of course there's links um, and um, to some of the resources, we have a rich collection of resources at Esri, and you will all have access to that. And so in this presentation, I provided a lot of um, links to share with you. So it's exciting to speak with you, you know, fellow um, geospatial users and community, and I look forward to the questions you might have on what we're going to be presenting. Um, so um, in terms of ISPRS, in general. Um, these conferences were the ones I've been fortunate enough to attend and either speak at, um, have um, workshops and that sort of thing, and it's been always a wonderful experience. The conferences are long enough that you get immersed in papers and research and networking with fellow folks that you make friends and, you know, scientific buddies for years. Um, and so I encourage you to continue on your path to partake in these events. Um, myself, I consider my foundation, you know, working in university and doing some little work and building my remote sensing um, knowledge. And then, you know, once I moved into 2001, starting to be a, more of a consumer and actually working with um, companies that are using remotely sensed technology to be able to um, solve um, all kinds of problems in, in many different applications. And then I spent some time um, you know, coming up with solutions that the customers would want. And then after a period of building your foundation and being a user, you know, you can enter into the field of being an expert. Um, and so, you know, starting to increase in, in your job position, um, having, um, working with many different users and getting to travel the globe um, and different applications. Um, and then, of course, once you do that for a bit, you'll start to be an influencer. You start to then work at the director type level and actually impacting change or what we're going to be doing um, in this field. So, um, what, what, and this is where I am now, and I've changed um, roles even since I've been with Esri. Um, and this latest one I'm very excited by uh, because we'll be focusing on you know, scientific applications and the use of our software for that and really amplifying that to the industry. So that's exciting for me. Um, the other thing is probably many of you know, you get to travel quite a bit um, in this field and take every opportunity to learn what you can, especially immerse yourself in culture um, because the world of remote sensing is incredible. So I talk about passion. Um, this is this chapter um, of IFSAR. It's for elevation data. 
Um, and it gives an intro of what it was. And this is an example of a radar image at X-Band. And that is one of my areas in the remote sensing world. I always say I work in the microwave portion of the electromagnetic spectrum rather than the visible. So it operates more like your ear, but the amount of information you can obtain from this data layer is incredible. And what's wonderful today is we're having so many constellations of SAR sensors being deployed that it's just, it, it gets me giddy. Um, and so I, I plan on working and starting to do a bit more scientific analysis with the new sensors um, that we're seeing um, in SAR. In terms of users of our software, you can see here, um, we are everywhere and we put our customers first and our customers are who advance our software. They give us ideas, requests, things that, may, that get us excited and then we will update the software to include and enhance um, their world and to make the world a better place. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. And if any of you had been following the COVID-19, the work we've been doing, we have people around the clock working to help um, every facet, every organization, every job description, you name it, um, to try to make sense of what's been going on and try to help navigate through this difficult time. So in terms of, um, you know, we think about Earth observations with ArcGIS, you know, we're starting to work with pixels, you know, so GIS has been points, lines, and polygons, but you know, in the remote sensing world, we're, we work with pixels and that is fully integrated into the platform. And so that's pretty exciting. And we have so many tools that allow us to start to analyze and make sense of what we're seeing in our pixels. Um, so we have, you know, the comprehensive package and many different tools. I've got some links later on for you to go and look at if you're interested, just to get some insight into from a remote sensing standpoint, what kind of tools are available to you to utilize, as well as what kind of free learning and training opportunities are there for you to learn, um, to, to grow your own skill set. In many cases, there's ones that actually give you certificates. Um, so there's a lot, a lot going on there, and it's very exciting. Let me make sure I watch my time. Oh, I've got to move quickly. Okay, so in terms of the whole platform, it goes all the way from, you know, observing, measuring, informing, collaborating, being able to share out your information, either through a dashboard, through um, a connection, through ArcGIS Online, to be able to share your model, which is very exciting. Um, and we work in the remote sensing world, you know, in all of these formats. So when we're doing management of data, actually producing products, viewing the data, viewing it in both 2D and 3D, the analysis and an incredibly rich content um, through the ArcGIS um, Atlas of the World. The amount of data layers that are available to the end user are incredible. And I encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, there'll be links to that. So this is the, in, in Within Azure, we talk about capabilities. So two that are pertinent to this audience are the imagery and the remote sensing capability, as well as the next one, uh, spatial data science capability. And so I have two slides with this in terms of how to go and access these to learn more. And here's something that is of interest to you folks, perhaps. Um, given that many university students are not actually on campus, Azure is offering free access to the RTIS software until August once you sign up here. So this is a link for the users if you're interested and go check it out. And there's all kinds of free learn lessons in imagery and remote sensing for you to access. Um, the next one you'll see um, a video that YouTube link, I'm not gonna play that here, but go to that, just gives an overall breadth of what is possible from a global scale of um, using remotely sensed data in conjunction with geospa other geospatial data sets um, to, for any type of application. So it, it is worthwhile to watch it. A few different applications, and as most of you are, you know, being in the remote sensing world, the possibilities with remote sensing and geospatial data are endless. And so some examples here, um, you know, if you can think of what you could do with remotely sensed data and make the world a better place, I'm sure there are many folks with you. 
um, who are willing to do that as well. And so on the spatial and data science, this is the other capability I talk about, which I think would be of interest to you. So again, resources for you to access. I just finished, they had a, a massive online course with spatial data science and Esri offers that. Um, I'm not sure when the next one is, but we'll find out about that and you get a certificate for it and you could get access to our software and learn how to do some data science and the, the support with that package, that course is just incredible. And in addition to that, some additional learn lessons for you. So, ooh, I've got a really motor. So if I think about traditional surveying mapping, back in the day, I mean, we were doing this kind of 3D photogrammetric analysis to be able to take our imagery and tie it to the ground, do aerial triangulation and all of that. And if we fast forward to today, when we're looking at moving away, or I mean, we're still working with aerial and satellite platforms, but if we move to drones, I'll just, um, it is truly a disruptive technology because there's many users that are working with drone technology and they don't know the first thing about photogrammetry or how to even tie that data to the ground. And so, you know, we responded to that um, by creating um, our first here, seeing the different levels of, you know, a lawyer, a medical person, a sales manager, um, firefighter, multimedia folks. These are folks who are now using something like drone to map software to process drone data. And yet they still need that data to be tied to the ground. And they don't know the first thing about photogrammetry. So if we fast forward to today, we are seeing packages that allow our end users to get all the way to your handheld device. The software process it, it does is its aerial triangulation, it does the stitching, produces, you, you can update um, with ground control points to improve the accuracy, but you can also let the software tie that data to the ground. And we're able to do that because we have so many rich data layers that we can use our own jack ground control points to be able to bring that into the, um, the package and allow someone who's in the medical world and not really focused on doing from scratch how to do this photogrammetry can actually still get to that place um, with something like drone to map. So it's pretty exciting time, in my opinion. Here's a whole series of resources for you folks. Um, including some learn lessons and this whole set of resource, it, it reaches every sort of interest, whether it's a blog, uh, a white paper or a story map or a training course, but real um, customer experiences using drone in the remote sensing and, and geospatial world um, for you to take a look at. And then in terms of spatial data science, what I've been noticing, we're now looking at 27 industries that are actually starting to use data science. And look at this, this is from a recent webinar that we did where we had hundreds of people attend and we captured about 113 different job titles. I mean, that's just crazy, um, but it's very exciting because most of the data science um, analysis we were talking about was working with remotely sensed data coupled with geospatial, other geospatial um, data sets. So it's just wonderful. Um, in terms of image analysis, I had mentioned that you know, our software has really moved to the point where our raster capability, the tools um, to, to, for the end user is incredible and all, way, all the way to the open source, being able to bring in work with Python, it's incredible. And I'm, I'm pretty sure Joseph's going, Joseph is going to show you some demos to give you some insight. And AI is the latest big one. Um, artificial intelligence and, and again it's working with you know remotely sensed data um, recently we've done quite a few webinars on this and we're looking at 19 industries banking and security are looking at this I mean and you now 50 or so different job titles and so this space is going to grow over time and I think it's an exciting time for US students to think about how you can make an impact whether it's developing a model or some research that can help any users in, in these areas um, to, to, you know, perfect their um, application. I think it's very exciting. Um, I'll pass the deep learning workflow, but we're able to do end to end. And we have another webinar coming up on this. Um, and so if anyone is interested, um, it also will be talking about our API for Python or RTIS API for Python so that you, you can bring in your own libraries and 
and start to model with that. So it's very exciting. So the next two slides are more additional resources for you to read later. Let's go back to that previous one. So these will all be available and they're all links that you can connect and zone in on what you, I know it's maybe information overload, but there's just so much um, available to you to help you learn and grow um, in the remote sensing world and using ArcGIS to help with your analysis. Um, in terms of career tips, um, you know, I'll leave this last slide, slide for you, um, but you know, um, I'm very interested in the research projects that you guys are working on, and I'd be more than happy if anyone wants to share them with me. There, you know, my new role in earth sciences, there's potential to be able to help collaborate, help support and whatnot. So I'm pretty interested in learning that. So I think I've hit my 20 minutes, maybe a little more. Um, and so I think we're going to, the plan is to go to Joseph and he will, um, let me just reach up. He will go through his presentation and then we'll follow up with a Q and A. So I'm going to stop share, sharing, Joseph, and hopefully you yeah. can. Okay. Okay. Super. All right. Hopefully you're seeing me in front of the geography sign on the Esri campus in Redlands, California. All good? Yes. Ah, super. Well, thanks, Dr. Tai. That was, I always learn things that touches on one of the things that we're going to talk about here in this segment as well is I think you're getting a sense, and I know you all in ISPRS land are the same way. You're lifelong learners. I think Dr. Tai and I both are really united on that. We're, we're always learning things. I just learned a whole bunch of stuff from her that I didn't know before. So we would like to definitely keep in touch with you all. If there's anything we can do to help your geospatial journey, that's what we're here for. This is how to get a hold of me. I'm very active on social media and so on and so forth. And I'm also very passionate about all this. So this Our Earth video channel of mine, it's pretty geeky. It's pretty nerdy. <laughs> but I'm going to start my uh, time uh, uh, clock here so I don't exceed my time. But this is, I've got 5,000 videos out here. Okay, 5,000. So I'm very passionate about all things geo, earth, environment, biology, mathematics, history, etc., all centered around geospatial technology and how we can understand our world. So that's another uh, resource that I hope is helpful. All right. The way I like to think about this, folks, is as follows. What's where, why is it there, and why should we care? Right? What's where, why is it there, and why should we care? Yes, Dr. Tai and I and you all in ISPRS um, love the tools. We love the data. But what GIS has always been, and geotechnologies, has always been about this tool. Right? It's a thinking tool. It's always been about a thinking tool way back when it was invented by Roger Tomlinson and his team up in Canada, eh? Way back in the 1960s. It has always been about solving problems, thinking critically and thinking spatially. So that is exactly, sure, the tools have changed. The data are more accessible than ever. Uh, we've got new capabilities, as Dr. Tai mentioned and described, I thought, really well. But it has always been about, okay, what do we do with this? And, and those of you that are students, which I think is, is most of you, as you journey forward in your career, this is a technology I think that you can feel really good about, right? Because it's being used to make a more sustainable, healthier, happier planet. It really is, as uh, mm -hmm. so you can feel good about that. And as Dr. Tai mentioned, at no time than the present have people been looking at maps, dashboards, infographics, et cetera, with the current situation that we're in right now. I mean, this is, I wish it hadn't taken a crisis, but people have been looking at these by the millions per hour, as you probably know. Not just because the technology is interesting, but because they need to make behavioral decisions, they need to plan, uh, uh, put plans in place for their communities, their regions, etc. So these these tools and dashboards and and um, maps, there's no way this would have been able to be put together and leveraged in such a way that the community around the world could take advantage of all of this and build their own dashboards and maps and decision making processes without the advent of web GIS. That has been a huge leap forward for GIS because way back in the 
late Cretaceous period, maybe the early Jurassic, <laughs> when I first started with GIS, back when the dinosaurs were roaming the planet is what I'm getting at. And it was old and it was clunky. It was really hard for like yeah. Dr. Ty and I to share data. It was too, you know, we couldn't email it. Oh, do we have to put it on physical media? There were all these technological constraints. And not to say that it's all easy now, because as you students well know, it's not just click, 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 push button, and therefore I'm done. It's still this. It's still how do I use this effectively to make wiser decisions? So there's still pieces and components, but it is vastly easier technologically with open data services or open data portals and data as services and so on that we'll describe. The really fascinating thing for me though, when I look at stuff like this, is realize that you can actually create these kinds of things yourself. It's not just, oh, I'll let other organizations do that. But the whole empowering thing that you, know, you and I are all excited about is that everybody can actually be a map creator, a data creator. And I'll just show you one simple example because of the time limitations, but I'm very passionate about walkable communities. How, how walkable are your communities? Okay, so I've got a story map that I built here about, hey, what's, what's walkability? Why do people care about it? Why do city planners care about it? So this is a story map. It's a story map. It's a multimedia map. And if you haven't made a story map, I highly encourage you to to start, it's pretty easy to do and it's very powerful. I still use PowerPoint and Prezi and other things, but I give a lot of my presentations. Even this one I started with back here, this is a story map as well, okay? So here's my story map on walkability. One of the things I wanted to mention here is that inside this story map, I actually have a, a link to Survey123, which is another ESRI tool that can be deployed by anyone and, and collected data out in the field using this. So you've probably used SurveyMonkey or uh, Google Forms in the past to create a survey. In fact, surveys are all around us, right? In the not too distant past when we were traveling, you barely get off the airplane before you get the survey, right? Hey, how was your flight? Let, let us know about it. <sighs> so we're over surveyed in some ways, but surveys are very common. And the nice thing about these survey one, two, three results here is, hey, is your community friendly or unfriendly? Uh, how is the walkability? Rate it. Is it dangerous? Uh, is there no path? Is there a path? Are there, is there bran other branches? And then where is it located, right? We always ask the where question. And then do you have a photo? Okay, so this is an open survey. You can take it. I can take it. Anybody can take it because I've crowdsourced it. I've shared it with the whole world. They don't have to be in ArcGIS online. They don't have to have an account for anything. They just go out and take it. Then inside my story map, I have the results of the, the survey. So for example, right here, I was in Australia not too long ago teaching. Good on you, mate. She'll be right. Uh, so here's, my, here's one of my photos, okay, that I took in my own survey. So I've got it rated as a walkable place. Nice big pathway and sidewalk as you see right there. The point is you've got this live feed coming in from the survey. So this could be about anything. Walkability, water, water quality, um, invasive species, right? Anything that you're concerned about. And the last thing that I have, which is the whole reason why I really brought this up, is because at the end of my walkability story map, I have what should look pretty familiar. This is a dashboard. So I've got the results. I've got two thirds of the points. I've got 376 points on here right now that people have taken or I have filled out my own survey. And two thirds of them are friendly. One third is, are not friendly. And then here are the results in the, uh, the attributes. And then here's a little map legend, a little photograph, and then the actual live interactive web map. The point is, this is a dashboard. It took me about an hour and a half or so to create, nothing major. You know, where do I want the charts? Where do I want, no coding required. But it's the same tool is this. Now this one is, is taking live feeds from multiple different organizations. And sure, it took, it took a, a more than an hour and a half to set up. But the point is you are empowered as a geospatial person to create things with these tools. So I think it's very, uh, it's, it's, let me just have a moment. It, it almost brings tears. It is just awesome that you can do this. So what I'd like to focus on is one of the things is the where question. So, you know, Dr. Tai talked about, you know, her, uh, you know, the warm weather they're having in Southern California right now. And we've got this global community on this uh, webinar right now. And this is a typical, you know, my typical Colorado scene. Bank clouds, so lee, lee side of the mountains, you get these wave clouds that sit up there for several days at a time. We've got some short grass prairie in the foreground, the Rocky Mountains beginning in the background, lots of outdoor activities. 
I happen to be on my bicycle, but you see people riding horses. And so this is what I consider to be sort of the, the typical environmental photograph of my location. Also be, with the paved path indicates a lot of human impact on the landscape. So sure, there's a lot of population growth in our area because People like living here. They like the outdoor activities. They like the good weather that we have, et cetera. So what, um, you know, what photograph would you choose to indicate your, the reason your location, the reason why I mention is because we're very tied to place still. It's, it's a very fundamental part of being human, isn't it? And I'd like to mention this also in this short time that I have with you all. And that is, you know, these lists of things on the internet, the five coolest places you should see in Asia, the five coolest bands of all time, right? They're all, they're all subject to debate and that's fine. These are my five converging forces that I believe bring us to a really opportune moment in the world of geospatial technology, GIS, remote sensing, GNSS, web mapping, etc. And again, they're subject to debate, but I just want you to think about these. First of all, geo-awareness has been a huge uh, trend and leap forward in the world of geospatial technologies. Yeah, people are aware of they're using some sort of web maps and satellite images when they try to find the nearest library or their school or university campus or the directions to you know their grandmother's house, et cetera. Right? They're using some sort of geotechnologies. So they're enabled, the geo-enablement piece, they're enabled to use at least some of these tools. It's no longer just for the geospatial professionals. That's, that's good. It leads to geo-awareness or in part leads to geo-awareness. All these issues on our planet ranging from the current health issues that we're confronting to natural hazards, water quality and quantity, population change, urbanization, economic inequalities, natural hazards. I mean, you name it. They're all geospatial in nature. They all have aware question. They have patterns, relationships and trends. And so the awareness of these issues I think is at an all time high. They may not always connect it to the need for geography education and environmental studies and um, uh, geotechnologies, but at least the, the awareness has grown, which is a good thing. You hear people talking about climate and hazards and population and so on, just in stairwells or on buses and airplanes and things. And then the geotechnologies themselves, as I mentioned, have evolved into this cloud-based environment is huge. And I'll give you a short demo of that here in a moment. Citizen science. So my walkability survey, right? That is citizen science enabled. Now, citizen science goes way back to the late 19th century with, you know, birders. How many of you know birders? They're very passionate about, ooh, that species of bird, that tree, this is the season, this is the time of day, this is the call of the bird, this is the color of the feathers. So, so citizen science goes back, but it's, it's had a big resurgence now because we're able to map that data and then also make a difference in our community. So, okay, maybe my survey isn't going to change a lot of communities' minds, but if it changes one community's mind about hey, maybe we should pay attention to the walkability in our community. Why don't we have more sidewalks? Why is it impossible to cross the street, et cetera? So citizen science has become a very big part of GIS. It's, it's, it's the source of a lot of data in GIS, that and the Internet of Things and some other things we'll mention. I've got 10 minutes left. Okay, got to be brief, just like Dr. T said. All right, <laughs> storytelling, storytelling. I'm, I'm using the story map, storymaps.arcgis.com. Take a look at that. I don't have time to show you, but there is there are over 1 million story maps on biomes, water, population, history, et cetera, art. And so people are starting to use maps as communication tools as never before. That's, that's really, uh, really quite exciting. Now, one of the things that I wanted to... Um, get into with you all is as follows. I've got ArcGIS Online here. Okay, I've got a seamless map of the world, great. You've got ArcGIS Online in your own institution, institution as part of your institutional uh, package. We can talk more about educational use of GIS. So I've got this world map. Okay, I've got a base map and that's about it. What if I added uh, biomes to this map? Okay, so let's go ahead and how do I change this map? I go to modify map in the upper, upper right. I go to add, search for layers and I search for biomes. Okay, I'm seeing some layers. Now, this will tie into what I mentioned in a moment, and that is, where does the data come from? Who created it? Why was it created? What scale was it created at? Is it curated? All of that sort of thing is going to be really important. When you can grab data layers like I'm doing here, um, you really need to be critical of the data. Where does it come from? Now, you don't believe everything you see on the internet, right? And hopefully, you don't believe all the maps that you see. Maps can be, most of the time, inadvertently misleading but sometimes intentionally, but what, what projection are you using? What scale are you using? What symbols and classification methods and so on? So I've got biomes, great. Now, how about population density? Okay, 
So I'm going to add some population density. This is just in ArcGIS Online. Great. I see a couple of things. I see, oh, I, I see some authors' names as well. I see this GPW population density of the world. Okay. Yep. And I know what the GPW data set uh, sets are because I've looked at them in the past. So, okay, now I've got population density as well. We can look at the legend in a moment. And then the last thing, I want to add some data that, that uh, focuses on the whole internet of things and being able to ingest real time data. So I'm going to add recent earthquakes. Okay. So I've got a map now with three different layers in it. And I'm, I'm, liking, the, I'm liking the base map. Okay. Let's change it to a light gray canvas just to kind of uh, shadow the, the, the base map behind these layers. Okay, so let's say I want to look at the legend. Okay, so now I've got recent earthquakes. Okay, uh, last 30 days according to this data set. Okay, interesting. So I can see some patterns. Maybe I add the fault lines. Maybe I add the plate boundaries so I can understand this a little bit better. I've also got the population density with darker colors with a higher population density. And I've also got the biomes, which is actually hidden right now by the population density. Okay, so the point is within a, about a minute, I had some decent data to look at, to examine, to look at spatial patterns. How do I make critical decisions about what data to use, whether it's mine or someone else's? You are a data producer nowadays. You're not just a data consumer. Everyone is a data producer. So a colleague and I started the Spatial Reserves Data Blog a number of years ago after we wrote this GIS Guide to Public Domain Data Book from SRE Press. In here, we go into those issues. How do I trust data? Where can I find data? What about location privacy? What about copyright? What about all of these things? Metadata. It sounds, a data blog admittedly sounds, it sounds super boring. We're right, folks? But um, really, it's, it's all about the current issues that we face. And I just encourage you, I admonish you to be critical of data and use this as a resource if it helps at all in the future. Okay, I've got about five and a half minutes. Hang in there with me, folks. No one's checking their email and checking their phone, right? Hopefully, this is all very engaging. Now, um, one of the other things that I wanted to uh, point out here is I'm going to skip down to, uh, I've got, as Dr. Uh, Ty had many more things that I'm actually going to be able to show. So I'm just going to skip to highlights. And this is, again, subject to debate, open for discussion, but I believe these are key trends. And actually, my colleague talked about a couple of these, so I don't need to go into all these in great detail. But it makes sense that we have a 3D world. We're going to be able to, we need to have 3D tools. Now, for years, we had 3D visualization tools in ArcGIS uh, platform, ArcGIS Pro, ArcMap, before it, and so on. And we've got 3D scene viewer, but, but now we've got analytical tools in 3D, which makes sense because, again, we need to look at subsurface geology. We need to look at interiors of buildings. We need to look at uh, the terrain uh, and, so, and so on. BIMCAD AEC, so building information management, building information um, um, modeling, computer-aided drafting, computer-aided design, architecture, engineering, and construction. In the past, it was kind of like um, what Dr. Tai talked about in terms of the remote sensing world and the GIS world. They were kind of separate. They, were, they, were, they overlapped a little bit. That was the way it was with GIS geotechnologies and interior space mapping. But now we've got a meeting of the minds between the S3 CEO, Jack Dangerman, and the Autodesk uh, CEO, for example. And so we're starting to see some tools. It wasn't just because of that meeting, but we're starting to see some tools that merge the interior space mapping with the external outside mapping, which makes sense, right? Because A, we spend a lot of time inside, and B, think about your own university campus. If there's some sort of weather event at 2 p.m. on a Friday, right, where are the students in, in a typical semester when you're actually on campus? Where are the students? Uh, where are the emergency exits? And it changes every semester, right, with changing configurations of classes. So we need to merge those interior space 3D maps with the external. Uh, think of a hospital example. Uh, okay, we've got 15 ambulances all of a sudden coming into the hospital. Where are the where are the gurneys? Uh, I don't know. I found I I saw some on floor 4A in the east wing an hour ago. Well, that's not gonna that's not gonna work, right? When people's lives are at stake. So what if they were all geotagged and we had a 3D model of the building? We could get all the equipment and all the staff right where we needed it to be inside that hospital. So that's just a couple of examples. Real-time data, I showed the earthquake example. Well, what about floods? What about stream gauges, uh, traffic counts, um, other things that are coming in from these weather data? People want data in real time or near real time. 
where's the wildfire perimeter? What's the COVID situation right now in my, in my city, et cetera. So that is now enabled through these web-based uh, data as services. Enterprise GIS, what I mean by that is in the past, this is dating myself a little bit, but okay, GIS used to be, oh, the GIS people in my city government or in my country, you know, natural resources department, yeah, go see them if you need a map or geospatial data. They're down the hall and to the right. They're kind of geeky, but they're nice people. Go talk to them. That's kind of how it was. It was sort of this niche thing. We go to certain people in an organization, but nowadays it's not completely realized yet, but we're seeing signs that GIS is being valued throughout an organization as an enterprise asset. Everybody has access to it and they're gonna serve the data even to the general public in many cases because they, they realize how valuable it is for ordinary decision makers. Great. AI and machine learning, I mean, picture your typical video, okay? This is me on a university campus. Think of all of the things that you're seeing. Trees, if you fed that into AI and therefore into GIS, every tree could be identified. Every post, every, st every sign, every condition of the curb, the condition of that road right there, um, the tree species, the condition of the buildings, uh, how much heat they're giving off, uh, et cetera. That could be fed into a geospatial uh, environment. And that is extremely beneficial to GIS because no longer we're going to have a lot of those typical entry level GIS jobs that were very tedious inserting all of that data by hand into a GIS database. You're going to be freed, you students going into GIS, you're going to be free to do, I think, the cooler stuff because a lot of this, the automated methods of gathering the data. Right, Dr. T, it's just going to be, yeah. you're going to be able to leap to the, really the analysis stuff, which, which we all love. We like div digging into data. Okay, I've got one minute to go here. Let me skip now to uh, some final thoughts with you. And that is, I just want to give you some sense of, like Dr. Ty was talking about, ESRI, we, our mission, if you go to the about page, which I don't have time to do, it's sustainability, science, and education. That, that is our threefold mission. I serve on the education team. And we have a special uh, task of helping students, faculty, deans, provosts, any university facilities managers, anybody, anybody in any aspect of education, libraries, museums, et cetera, to help them use GIS in teaching, research, and administrative use. So that is, that is our role as a team. Um, and so I wanted to let you know that uh, you know, we, we do take it seriously. Last, last bits. My, Again, list, debatable, but top five um, recommendations in, in terms of skill building. I think being curious is the most important thing. It's going to drive you forward into learning tools. It's going to drive you forward into going in the field, investigating. And like Dr. Ty, I think very well put it. You're not going to like looking at the clock going, oh, you know, is it quitting time? I really feel for those people in those professions that they're constantly, yeah, I wish I was somewhere else. In geospatial technology, you're going to meet lots of really passionate people that want to make a better world. And they're going to use tools and technology and data, yeah, but they're, again, they're going to think carefully and critically. And so they're all very curious and passionate. Uh, so keep, keep that going. Keep, keep blowing on the embers. You know, keep those in the flames. Also being able to work with data, as I mentioned a couple of times, be critical of the data. Remember my spatial reserves data blogs, not the end all be all, but hopefully it's helpful. And then know your geospatial foundations, right? Your electromagnetic spectrum um, on up through what is a buffer, what's an overlay, what is a, a Krieging, all those datums, all those are important actually in working with geospatial because a few people, especially you folks, need to know quite a bit about geospatial foundations. There are business people and people we work with in economics and others, they need to know a little bit about the geospatial foundations, but mostly they just wanna make a map of their data. Where are my customers, where are my competitors, et cetera. They don't need to know necessarily about all the things you need to know about. So, but I want everybody to know a little bit about geospatial. And also be adaptable, uh, being willing to go international. I mean, you, you folks are a great example of that. I mean, you're an international community already, but being willing to go outside your comfort, comfort zone maybe and work with some discipline uh, that you haven't worked with before. Um, that could be good because to solve these problems, we really need everybody weighing in. We need a lot of diversity of thought and background and so on. And then finally, have good communication skills. You know, keep, keep working at those. Um, have your elevator speech or your stairwell speech because someday you'll be in a stairwell or on a bus or on an airplane seat with someone and they'll 
And they may be your CEO, they may be your boss, they may be your stakeholders or your, your patrons, your, your, your constituents. And they'll say, why is what you're doing important? And you need to be able to articulate why it matters. Maybe you'll have a minute with them. Maybe you'll have five minutes. Maybe you'll have, so practice different lengths of speeches and put in the most important thing. Uh, okay, final, final word. I really believe that without these tools, it's, this is a geeky picture, I realize, but it's sort of like we're, we're sleepwalking into the future. We're not thinking carefully and critically about our future. But really, on a positive note, I really believe that with good people like you all in the ISPRS community, with good data, good tools, and a good network of people, we have a, a very bright future. I truly believe that. That's what I wanted to say, and I hope that's of help. I exceeded my time by one minute. I'm very sorry, but hopefully we'll have some question and answer time.